Well, thank you for joining us uh, here this evening. I can't get through uh, the entire uh, history of the English Bible, but I'm going to start with the very first uh, Bible in English. It was in Middle English, and that is the Wycliffe Bible, the Wycliffe Bible. And uh, the Wycliffe Bible was translated from the only Bible that was available in that day, and that was the Latin Vulgate. While the Latin Vulgate had uh, numerous corruptions in it, uh, it also contained the Word of God, you know, and so um, many people, uh, uh, as you'll see, came to know the Lord Jesus Christ because of the efforts of uh, John Wycliffe. His name is spelled uh, 10 or 11 different ways. Uh, so uh, you'll see uh, W-I-C-L-I-F, W-I-C-L-I-F-E, W-I-C-L-I-F-F, -F, uh, and all the rest of them. But <clears throat> uh, it was into a very repressive, stupor, superstitious environment that um, uh, the world of the Inquisition, John Da Wycliffe was born. So what does Da mean? Uh, that's French. And so uh, I would be, if I was following the old uh, method of identifying people, I would be David of Pontiac because I was born in Pontiac, Michigan. John was born in Wycliffe on Tees. That's a little stream. So uh, he, he was born probably in 1324. And uh, his family, as I already mentioned, was... Uh, uh, from Wycliffe on Tees in, in uh, northern England. And um, <laughs> it was a strange time. There was no Bible at uh, uh, the Catholic Oxford University. In, 15, uh, uh, in 1553, three Irish priests came to England to study divinity, but they were obligated to go home because there was not a single copy of the Bible to be found at Oxford University, but that's not uncommon for Catholics because Catholics don't study the Bible. Uh, Catholics uh, study canon law. And so uh, John Wycliffe was uh, in 16, uh, 1361, Wycliffe was ordained as a Roman Catholic priest. That's the only kind that was allowed uh, back then uh, in England. And he started out really as an ardent Catholic. I mean, promoting Catholic doctrine and all that, uh, he was, uh, 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 all of a sudden, he started studying the Latin Vulgate. He started studying the Holy Scriptures, and uh, it led him to change his Catholic views and reject its teachings. He began to preach against various Catholic doctrines in his late 30s. Uh, he wrote a series of theological pamphlets, we call them tracts, and he opposed begging friars. They'd go around to support themselves by uh, offering indulgences and, and begging for food and work. And he was opposed to works salvation. I already mentioned indulgences. Uh, he said purgatory was baloney. Uh, confession, that was called auricular confession. That means in the ear confession to the priest. And he was ardent against transubstantiation. What is transubstantiation? Well, when the priest holds up the host and says, hocus corpus, the Roman Catholic Church teaches that it turns into the literal body of the Lord Jesus Christ and that the cup turns into the literal blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. John Fox says in his Fox's Book of Martyrs that you saw out there that a lot of times the priests would try and fool the people and they would uh, put duck's blood in, uh, in the cup. But anyway, Wycliffe is uh, Oxford's uh, colleges. Uh, he, he was at Balliol College, and uh, he was the leading professor at Balliol College in Oxford, England. He was called the Gospel Doctor. It's hard for me to get my head around this, uh, but uh, he attracted students from all over Europe, and one historian that I read said 30,000 students came to be taught the Bible by him because he would teach them in 
a language which they understood, and he wouldn't promote Catholic doctrine. He would teach them the scriptures. Well, uh, from uh, 1324 to 1384, um, we, uh, that's his lifetime. Uh, to Wycliffe, we owe uh, more than to any one person who can be mentioned our English language and our English Bible. Um, uh, I agree with that to some extent, though I think uh, uh, William Tyndall uh, did as good or better for us, but uh, it is the first Bible in English and the people just ate it up. Uh, Wycliffe had a passion uh, that the Bible should be in English. Uh, the sacred scripture is to be the property of the people, he said, and one which no party should be allowed to rest or take from them. Uh, the priests declare it to be heresy to speak of the Holy Scriptures in English. Such a charge is a condemnation to the Holy Ghost, who first gave the scriptures in the tongues uh, to the apostles of Christ, to speak the word in all the languages that were ordained of God under heaven. You're talking about Pentecost here. Every man heard in the language wherein he was born. And that's Wycliffe said, you guys who just want Latin, you're all wet. Uh, it's a front to the Holy Spirit because people need to know the word of God in a language that they can understand. And Wycliffe said that the sacred scripture is to be the property of the people uh, and one which no party can take. I just repeated that again. Uh, in, or did I? Let's see. Uh, let's see. Nope. Okay. Wycliffe on the necessity of the people to have a Bible in the common language. I like this. Remember, he's a Roman Catholic priest, but he's born again. He rejects Catholic doctrine. He writes against Catholic doctrine. Those heretics, speaking of the Roman Catholics, who pretend that the laity need not know God's law, but that the knowledge which the priests have imparted to them by word of mouth is sufficient, do not deserve to be listened to. Wow. For the Holy Scriptures is the faith of the church, and the more widely its true meaning becomes known, the better it will be. Therefore, since the laity should know the faith, it should be taught in whatever language is most easily comprehended. Christ and his apostles taught the people in the language best known to them, Koine Greek. Um, Wycliffe really stood for the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, as uh, you heard, as Douglas shared with you, uh, Wycliffe's Catholic views changed so drastically that he was, first ca he was called later uh, the first Protestant and the morning star of the Reformation. Now, I want to add a postscript there. Um, Baptists aren't Protestants. Um, Protestant comes from the word protest. And uh, uh, that means that they protest tested against the Catholic Church and came off the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, Baptists never came off the, the Catholic Church. Uh, usually what happens was is a group of Baptists would form and then they would be killed. And then another group, they were called by different names. They were called Anabaptists. That means again Baptists. They're, they were baptized by immersion instead of sprinkled. They're, they're called Paulicians. They're called other, a number of names throughout history. Uh, but um, I had the opportunity in Addleston, England, uh, to stand here in front of the Wycliffe tree, the Gospel Oak. Uh, m churches wouldn't let Wycliffe uh, preach in uh, their buildings. Uh, this tree is on the edge of Windsor Forest. It's over a thousand years old uh, when I'm standing there in front of the tree. And Wycliffe would regularly preach the Gospel of Christ in the open air there under this tree. Other preachers followed his pattern. John Knox uh, and uh, uh, um, boy, it's escaped, escaped me now. It was um, Whitfield, George Whitfield, thank you. 
George Whitfield, and one that you'll know, um, he went there, Charles Spurgeon went there and preached under that tree as well. Um, uh, I preached under that tree, but Linda was the only one <laughs> who was there to listen. Uh, but nonetheless, um, the Roman Catholic Church hated John Wycliffe. They just hated him with a passion. Uh, he was bold against the Pope. He said, I suppose, and with much probability that the Roman Pontiff is the great Antichrist. <laughs> um, he said this. He said, the authority of the scriptures is independent on any uh, of, it should say of, of any other authority and is preferable to every other writing, but especially, look at this, but especially to the books of the Catholic, uh, of the Church of Rome. <laughs> well, uh, we were talking about this. Uh, Doug was talking about this. They, uh, the Papas tried um, uh, Wycliffe three times uh, and uh, they wanted to convict him, but without success. Uh, this is uh, February 9th, uh, 19th, 1337. Uh, down here, uh, they had John Wycliffe, and he was standing. This is Wycliffe here, and a soldier guarding him. This is John of Gaunt. We'll talk to you about him in a minute. He was the protector of John Wycliffe. Uh, he was of royal blood, and, and this is the high mucky muck, the, the, uh, the cardinal, or maybe the archbishop of London there. And um, uh, John of Gaunt said, you should let Wycliffe sit down. And they said, no, he'll stand. And Gaunt pulled out his sword and said, he's going to sit. So while they're arguing, Wycliffe turned around and walked away. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, here's the deal. Uh, in uh, the Tower of London, uh, they had John of Gaunt's armor on display. John of Gaunt, the Duke of Lancaster, was the fourth son of Edward III and was a powerful protector of John Wycliffe. Um, he was a big man for his day. Uh, as you can see, there's a sign there. His armor was six feet nine inches tall, so he had to be at least six seven uh, in that. So uh, most of the people were five five, five six, five seven in that day, <laughs> and so he towered over them. And then Queen Joan, they try him again. Uh, she intervenes in 1378 and. The trials at Lambeth Palace, you're not supposed to take pictures in Lambeth Palace. I don't know, my camera somehow went off. Um, but, but anyhow, uh, the, the lady uh, said, uh, now you're not supposed to take any pictures in here. And then she walked away and my camera went off. <laughs> anyway, Wycliffe was tried for heresy, but Queen Joan sent her man, Richard Clifford, with a message forbidding them to pass sentence on him. It says, if you convict him, you're going to have me to contend with. So they did not convict him. Uh, well, the, the next trial uh, takes place at Lambeth Palace. And uh, here is the Lollard's Tower right over here. Uh, this complex is the Lollard's Tower. And many of John Wycliffe's um, followers were held in the Lollard's Tower before they were burned at the stake. Uh, this is the Thames River. It looks like Thames, but it's pronounced Thames. And Kitty Corner across from the Thames River uh, is the Houses of Parliament. Uh, so if you ever get to, over to England, the Houses of Parliament cross the river and uh, walk along the edge, and you will actually see a door that still has on it, uh, as of three years ago when I was in England again, that says Lollard's Tower on it. Uh, then you'll, you'll know that you're at Lambeth Palace. But uh, uh, the they, uh, Earthquake Synod, May 21st, 1382, the Archbishop of Canterbury, William Courtney, called a meeting of uh, church officials uh, and uh, uh, to convict Wycliffe. An earthquake disrupted the proceedings. However, they condemned him 
as a heretic on 10 accounts. Um, Wycliffe was summoned to Oxford then uh, to defend his beliefs, and he was expelled as a teacher from Oxford. Remember, 30,000 people had come to be educated by him. They expelled him from Oxford because he taught against transubstantiation, saying that the bread and the wine of the Lord's Supper did not change substance, but was merely a symbol. That's what we believe. It's a symbol. We don't believe that it changes substance of the body and blood of Christ. And so they sent him way north to Lutterworth Church. Uh, and what he did when he got there is start working on uh, the translation of the Latin Vulgate into his Wycliffe Bible with John Purvey's oh, help. This is Lutterworth St. Mary's. I've been to there numerous times. Still stands today. And uh, at Lutterworth, um, Wycliffe and Con uh, Company translated the Bible into Middle English. It's a little different than ours. has some words uh, from uh, Anglo-Norman, Anglo-Saxon in it. Uh, it took 10 months to copy uh, the Wycliffe Bible and was very, very expensive. Uh, but here's what Wycliffe did. He trained lay preachers. They called them Lollards and armed them with Bibles or portions of Bibles and sent them out through England. He sent them out with sermon outlines as well. Now, they didn't do like I did. I gave you a page of a Geneva Bible. If you didn't get one from me, see afterwards, and I'll be glad to give you one free of charge. Uh, but they went throughout England uh, preaching the Word of God, reading the Scripture to the people, and the people gathered around. Uh, they, uh, they coveted to hear the Word of God in English instead of Latin, which only educated people knew Latin. They didn't know Latin. But anyway, uh, many of them were arrested and this is the door I'm talking to you about. If you look closely, it says Lollard's Tower. And it opens up into the complex where the Lollard's Tower is. One of the men was a wealthy man. His name was Sir John Oldcastle Lord Cobham. And he paid with his life, as did many others. Uh, and uh, uh, what happened with him was, is he uh, spent his fortune having scribes pen the, the Wycliffe Bible, make copies of the Wycliffe Bible for him, and he'd go out preaching. Well, the first time he was arrested and put in the Tower of London, but he made friends uh, with the, the Tower Guard, and upon the promise of coming back, they'd let him out every weekend, and he'd go out and preach, and then come back. Uh, but the, they, they found out that that was going. They replaced the guard. I don't know what happened to him, probably dead, but anyhow... The next time they got him and they uh, roasted him like a pig over uh, the flames. Uh, on December 28, 1384, Wycliffe has a stroke. Uh, and I'm sitting in, this is the actual chair that Wycliffe sit in. I'm sitting in the Wycliffe chair that's still in the church. Um, they put him in this chair. They took him out that door. Uh, here's me without the, here's the chair without me sitting in it. That's the door. Uh, and on New Year's Eve, 1384, Wycliffe goes home to be with the Lord and is buried in the Lutterworth churchyard. Um, the church was not done with Wycliffe. When I say the church, I'm talking about the English Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church in England. The English uh, Catholic Church wanted to stamp out the influence of, Wyc of Wycliffe even after his death. Archbishop Arundel wrote to the Pope in 1411, uh, this pestilent and wretched John Wycliffe, cursed of memory, the son of the old serpent, endeavoreth by doctrine of holy church, devising to fill up the measure of his malice. Uh, and, 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 you know, and what he did was he makes a new translation of the scripture in the mother tongue. Ah! <laughs> um, was Wycliffe a success? <laughs> It's hard for me to believe, but this is what I read, and one historian wrote this. Ten years after Wycliffe was dead, you cannot travel anywhere in England, but of every two men you meet, one will be a Lollard. 
He'll be preaching the gospel. Hmm. The ministry of the Lollards, between 1363 and 1400, Lollards founded no less than 25 grammar schools that were free from Roman Catholic control for the purpose of teaching students how to read and to teach them the truths of the Bible. Wow. And then we come to the Council of Constance. 30 years after Wycliffe's death, the Roman Catholic Church took official action at the Council of Constance in 1415 and condemned Wycliffe on 260 accounts of heresy. And they ordered his bones to be exhumed from the consecrated ground of Lutterworth and burned. Uh, their orders weren't carried out for another 13 years, hence 44 years after Wycliffe's death, his bones were exhumed, burned along with all the Bibles and books that he penned that they could find, and um, uh, his ashes were thrown into the creek, really, it's a small stream called the Swift. The Church of Rome thought they would stamp out his influence and, and stand as a warning to future heretics. But historian Thomas Fuller puts it this way. They burnt his bones to ashes and cast them into the swift, a neighboring brook running close by, hard by. Thus the brook conveyed the ashes to the Avon, that's a river, the Avon to a Severn, which is a large river, and the Severn into the narrow seas, uh, and they into the main ocean. Thus, the ashes of Wycliffe are the emblem of his doctrine, which is now dispersed all the world over. Now, this is a 1410 Wycliffe Bible mentioned in Fox's Book of Martyrs. It was owned by Richard Hun. And when I was the deputy curator of the Ink and Blood Museum, a huge, huge Bible display, I got to place this Bible that is mentioned in Fox's Book of Martyrs on this display. And uh, uh, I'm holding it here in my hands uh, in front of the picture of John Wycliffe. God mightily used that born-again man. Now we're going to come to uh, the Dark Ages. Uh, the Dark Ages, a thousand-year period. The Dark Ages are a thousand-year period where Rome uh, controlled everything from uh, birth to death, uh, to marriage, um, everything, education. Uh, Rome closed and locked the door of the scriptures. The only organized, recognized church in the Dark Ages was the Roman Catholic Church, and they refused to allow the scriptures to be available in any other language but Latin. For a thousand years, for a thousand years, the Roman Catholic Church kept the Bible away from the people. And this thousand year period is called the Dark Ages. Uh, darkness of superstition and idolatry reigned in the hearts and lives of, of men and women. Uh, the canon of the scriptures, uh, that means uh, Genesis to Revelation, the canon of the scripture was closed in 95 AD with the completion of the book of Revelation and the church rejected the Apocrypha which is in the Catholic Bible because there weren't any portions of the Apocrypha found in Hebrew so they wouldn't have anything to do with it. But early translations of the Bible by 500 AD the New Testament had been translated into many languages uh, and in, in, in just one century later in 600 AD, it was restricted to just the Latin Vulgate. Uh, the popes and priests were the sworn enemies of all who would translate and preach and read the Bible in the language of the people. They did not want the Bible 
uh, to be had by the people. Why? Because it contradicted Catholic doctrine. Roman Catholicism is not built on the Christianity taught in the New Testament. If Rome would have just followed Paul's book of Romans, then they would have been founded on the right foundation. Uh, it is Roman Catholicism, and I have one open back there, the Douay Reims Bible, and in the Lord's Prayer, uh, it says in nearly all versions of the English Bible, give us this day our daily bread. I have it underlined and I have a marker on it in the Roman Catholic Bible. It says, give us this day our super substantial bread. Uh, not there in the scriptures. But anyway, uh, it was a man-made Christianity, a false Jesus. It was promoting a false Jesus and a false gospel. The gospel of the Jesus of Rome is not the Jesus of the Bible. The gospel of Rome is not the gospel of the Bible. Uh, laws were instituted by Rome that made it illegal to translate the Bible into the common language. Here's John Fox, Fox's Book of Martyrs that I have on display out there, his characterization of the Church of Rome. He says, the religion of Christ, which only consisteth in spirit and verity, or spirit and truth, was wholly turned uh, into outward observation, ceremonies, and idolatry. Instead of the living Lord, we worship dead stocks and stones. In the place of Christ immortal, we adored uh, mortal bread. Instead of his blood, we worshiped the blood of ducks. I told you about that. Uh, in, in, instead of Christ's testament, the Pope's testament, that is canon law, instead of Paul, the master of sentences took place and almost full possession of Rome. And when he's talking about the master of sentences, he's talking about the work of Peter Lombard. Uh, and uh, Fox mentions the master of sentences. It's a reference to Peter Lombard, the Archbishop of Armagh in uh, 1096 to 1160. His most famous work um, as far uh, was the four books of sentences, which became the standard work of theology for medieval Roman Catholic church and universities. And then the Bible is prohibited. It's prohibited. Um, in the year 1215, Pope Innocent III, what a name, issued a law. It says that they shall be seized for trial and penalties, penalties who engage in the translation of the sacred volumes or who hold secret conventicles or who assume the office of preaching without the authority of their superiors against whom uh, process shall be commenced without any, listen to this, without any permission of appeal. You have no appeal. Um, and no legalized institution has ever done more to crush intellectual and religious liberty or add more to the unspoken miseries of the human race than the Inquisition. This is the history of the Christian church from origin to the present time by William Maxwell. He goes on to say, every layman daring to possess a Bible, now first forbidden to the laity by this council, was in prayer of the rack, the dungeon, and the stake. Dark ages, friends, dark. No Bible, no truth. Light through the keyhole, John 1, 5. And the light shineth in the darkness, as Tyndall wrote and translated, and the darkness comprehended it not. Uh, Jacqueline was talking about this. Uh, there's three events that hastened uh, the end to the Dark Ages, this thousand-year period. The first was the fall of Constantinople uh, to the Islamic Turks resulted in the Greek language and the Greek New Testament uh, moving into the West. Mohammed II captured Constantinople in 1454, the result was many scholars had to flee Europe with their sacred codices and uh, precious scrolls, uh, which uh, included writings from the early church fathers and all the scriptures in the original languages. Uh, most of these Eastern scholars took positions 
in the great uh, European universities, and it resulted in a renaissance of ancient learning, including the teaching of the Greek language. Uh, at the same time, there was the invention of the printing press, which would multiply the availability of books. What, in, what brought an end to the Dark Ages? Well, uh, I knew uh, Gutenberg personally. There he is. Uh, oh, excuse me. Uh, but um, uh, uh, it's, it's too big to, to get here. It's stored, in, um, it's stored in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. You have a facsimile, a small facsimile of the Gutenberg Press here. But uh, Gutenberg developed movable type. As I told you, he didn't develop the printing press. He modified the presses that were there because they were already printing on wood blocks, uh, hardwood blocks, what they wanted. But he was a goldsmith. He invented movable type. Uh, he had a desire for people to know the word of God. His name was, I would have changed my name, but it was John Ginsflesch Zum Gutenberg. A translation is John Gooseflesch of, Goose of Good Mountain. Uh, he was born in Mainz, uh, Germany. I've been to the Gutenberg Museum there, uh, I think, three times. Uh, but um, uh, he had an older brother named Friel. Uh, after his father, an older sister named Elsa, after his mother. And his father was a scribe, Friel Zum Gutenberg. Uh, his father, Friel, um, was a scribe whose job was cop uh, copying long, intricate manuscripts for the clergy and for the nobility and lawyers. They're the ones who had the money. And uh, the story goes that um, he was watching his dad one day and uh, he was carving his, uh, the initial of his nickname in a block of wood. His nickname was Henny, and that H dropped in the purple dye, and so he fished it out, and he put it on a piece of paper. He came back the next day and pulled it up, and there was an H. Now, there's some people who attribute that to the fact that he understood from what he did there uh, how you could make movable type uh, and uh, save scribes a lot of effort. Um, uh, young Gutenberg had a driving desire for common people to be able to have the Bible. He knew that if uh, it was to happen, uh, they would have to produce larger quantities uh, at uh, less expense um, uh, because handwritten copies were just out of reach for anybody. And here's what Gutenberg said. God suffers because of the multitudes whom, he, whom his sacred word cannot reach. Religious truth is captive in a small number of manuscript books which guard the treasures. Let us break the seal which holds the holy things, give wings to the truth that by means no longer written at great expense by the hand that worries itself, but multiplied by an unwearied machine, unwearied machine that it may fly to every soul born into the world. He wanted the scripture to the common people. Uh, the scribes guilt, guilt hated him. The unions hated him. Um, uh, he, um, you know, uh, he encouraged great, he encountered great resistance to the scribe saying, you're going to put us out of business. They feared Gutenberg uh, would, uh, would put their jobs in jeopardy. So they circu circulated vicious rumors. Um, rumors began to circulate that Gutenberg was an alchemist working uh, of, of, uh, on devilish things in his workshop. And Gutenberg really didn't mind that because it kept people away. Uh, he finally perfected it. And here I am. Uh, I printed a page from the Gutenberg Bible on the left and then a Psalm 1 from the King James Version of the Bible on the right on our Gutenberg press, our facsimile press uh, that was built there. Uh, Elvio talked to you about uh, the 1455 Gutenberg Bible. It's also called the 42-line Bible. But his business venture was not a success. Uh, the expensive Bibles did not sell well at the Frankfurt Book Fair. 
uh, because it cost about three years pay for an average uh, for an average clerk as opposed to 10 years pay if you had a handwritten one but still uh, uh, not everybody could afford them so he actually went out of business he lost the business shortly afterwards and in 1468 Gutenberg died living on a small allowance from his church when Gutenberg uh, what Gutenberg didn't see was that uh, about 50 years after his death, 20 million books had been printed on presses with uh, uh, styled after his design using his type. Uh, only 80 years after the presses were there, they were printing the Luther and the Tyndale Bibles by the thousand and other Reformation books. Uh, the third thing that brought an end to the Dark Ages is what uh, uh, Jacqueline was telling you about. It was Erasmus Desiderius from Rotterdam. Uh, this third event uh, was his printing of the 16, or no, 1516 Greek Latin New Testament. He had four revisions, uh, but he did the first one to point out the errors that were in the Latin Vulgate. He made a new translation of the Greek manuscripts that he had traveled all over Europe collecting. And uh, for instance, in Luke 13, 3 and 5, the Latin Vulgate says, except you do penance, you shall all likewise perish. And uh, he's, that was a wrong translation. He says, except you repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Erasmus was born in 1466. He was the second illegitimate son of Roger and Margaret Gerard. Uh, uh, Roger was a Dutch Catholic priest. He married a physician's daughter. Uh, his parents died when he and his older brother Peter uh, were quite young and they were forced to go into the Augustinian monastery in 1492. He is ordained as a Catholic tree, priest. But look at what Erasmus said. Would that these, speaking of his Greek New Testament, would that these were translated into each and every language. Would that a farmer might sing snatches of the scripture at his plow and the weaver hum phrases of the scripture to the tune of his shuttle. Um, <clears throat> Erasmus collated and published the world's first Greek New Testament in 1516 uh, by uh, translating the Greek New Testament texts and manuscripts into Latin uh, and then presenting both uh, for readership. And Erasmus was at odds with Rome. He differed with Rome on matters of salvation, on baptism, on the mass, on confession, and priestly celibacy. Erasmus held to the doctrine of believers' baptism by full immersion after salvation. Um, Erasmus is actually the father of the Anabaptists. And Anabaptist doesn't mean against Baptist. Anabaptist means again Baptist. Um, they were sprinkled in the Roman Catholic Church. They got studying the scriptures and saw it by immersion. And so they were baptized by immersion. And so hence they were called Anabaptists. Um, <clears throat> at the very least, he prepared the way for the Anabaptists and provided material uh, for the construction of their teachings. Erasmus's, um, you know, Erasmus's day, uh, the declaration was made at the Roman Catholic Council of Tolosi. Uh, in his day, it was still in effect. He said, um, it said this, we prohibit uh, the permission of books of the Old and the New Testament to laymen, except perhaps they might desire to have a Psalter, that's a book of Psalms, or a breviary uh, for divine service, or uh, the hours of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the story of Virgin Mary, uh, for devotion, expressly forbidding their having other parts of the Bibles translated into the vulgar or the common tongue. Erasmus vehemently disagreed. He says, I vehemently disagree with those who would have uh, private persons, uh, would not have private persons read the Holy Scriptures nor have them translated into the vulgar tongues. 
uh, as though either Christ taught such uh, difficult doctrines that they cannot be understood by a, but, but by a few um, theologians, or uh, safe, uh, safety of the Christian religion lay in the ignorance of it, I, I should like, listen to this, this is radical in his day, I should like all women to read the gospel and the epistles of Paul, would that they were translated into all the languages so that not only the Scots and the Irish and the Turks and the Corinthians might be able to read and know them. When Erasmus wrote that, possessing any portion of the English Bible was still illegal and it was punish punishable by death. It was a capital crime. Um, Erasmus is challenged by John Collette. He met uh, 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 Collette, Erasmus met Collette at Oxford University in 1499. Uh, Collette had a passion for the primitive texts of the scripture and he encouraged Erasmus to learn Greek and take the Greek New Testament uh, work up of translating it. Collette had done uh, some translating of the New Testament in English in 1498. And uh, so uh, Colette was a solid role model uh, for Erasmus. He was, uh, he was strict, he was a conservative Christian, uh, and he believed in living a separated Christian life. On April 15th, uh, a letter to John uh, Bratt Erasmus disclosed that he was applying his whole mind to learning the Greek, uh, spending what little money he had, as Jacqueline said when she's giving her presentation, uh, first on Greek books uh, with a clothing coming a late second. Uh, <laughs> Erasmus in 1504, uh, he read uh, Lorenzo Valla's annotations on the Old Testament. Valla sought to look back to the original languages of the scripture to overcome the false context that had crept in with the Latin Vulgate. Uh, Valla was, um, uh, made systematic comparisons of the text, evaluating the Latin Vulgate against the Greek New Testament. And then he recorded the departures of the Vulgate from uh, the Greek, uh, the commitment of Erasmus. In December of 1505, Erasmus wrote uh, to a uh, close friend, John Collette, communicating his commitment to study the scriptures the rest of his life. Wow. Erasmus, uh, in 1505, John Collette persuaded Erasmus to begin translation work on the Greek New Testament. Uh, uh, Greek is the key. Uh, Latin is a noun-oriented language. Um, it, it would, uh, if, you, if you translated, uh, take up thy bed and walk, it, it would assimilate your bed and preambulate, would be, it's a noun, Latin is a noun-oriented language. Uh, but Latin scholarship, however labit, is, is maimed and reduced by half without the Greek. Uh, for whereas the Latin have but a few small streams, a few muddied pools. The Greeks possess crystal clear springs and rivers that run with gold. He, can, he said, I can see what utter madness it is even to put um, a finger on that part of theology, which is specially uh, concerned with the mysteries of faith, unless one is furnished with the equipment of Greek. I was able to uh, spend uh, uh, parts of two summers at the uh, Desiderius, uh, or at the Erasmus Museum uh, and uh, um, outside of Brussels, Belgium. Erasmus was used of God to collect Greek manuscripts of the New Testament all over Europe. Uh, it says, uh, um, uh, this is the Erasmus uh, uh, House Museum outside of Brussels where he did some of his translation work. The Pope, trying to, you know, keep him from doing it, didn't want, didn't want the Greek out. The Pope offered to make Erasmus a cardinal. I, I don't understand why he didn't offer to make him an eagle, maybe a blue jay. 
uh, but he offered to make him a cardinal if he would stop his work on the Greek New Testament. But he refused, as did the martyr Savonarola, saying that he would not compromise his conscience. We need to stand on the word of God and not compromise our conscience, friends. Uh, the pressure's on Christians today. I know it. I, I am not going to accept the LGBTQ P plus. Um, it's against the scriptures. Erasmus was committed to putting the Bible into the hands of the common man for, uh, for the worldwide translation of the Bible, something no pope ever supported. Um, it is an historical fact that Erasmus was strong and public in his condemnation of Roman Catholic heresies. Rome branded him as an impious heretic and forbade his works for Catholics to read. Uh, this is inside the museum, and here's what Catholics did to a lot of his works. Uh, they didn't have highlighters in those days, so they burned out the section of Erasmus's works. Erasmus was a student of the New Testament. Uh, I'm seated, seated at his desk uh, there, with permission, I am seated at Erasmus's desk, uh, where he prepared... Um, and translated some of his, or, or collated his Greek New Testament. He wrote to the Vatican asking for Vatican readings, but the readings were so obtuse that he couldn't use any of them. And so, um, uh, <laughs> oh, okay. I didn't remember that was in there. Woo, cute. Anyway, uh, Erasmus unlocks the door. The entrance of thy word giveth light, it giveth understanding to the simple. In 1516, uh, the Greek New Testament was published. Uh, the Greek Latin New Testament was the first uh, uh, ever printed in one volume. It unlocked uh, and opened the door to vernacular translation into other language. Nobody used the 1516. He didn't design it for translators. He designed it to expose the heresy of the Latin Vulgate. Luther used the 1519 for his 1522 New Testament. William Tyndall used the 1522. This is a real uh, 1522 uh, Erasmus New Testament contains 1 John chapter 5 and verse 7. It's uh, started the line of what's called the received text. Uh, then um, uh, he did, um, as Jacqueline mentioned, the one that had three columns, Greek, Erasmus's translation and the Vulgate translation. And then 1535, only uh, the Greek New Testament. Um, the third edition, 1522, is chiefly remarkable for its inclusion of 1 John 5, 7, which was omitted from the previous editions. It served as the basis for the Texas Receptus. English Bibles that use Erasmus's TR, uh, the Tyndall Bible, the Coverdale Bible, the Matthews Bible, the Great Bible, the Geneva Bible, the Bishop's Bible, and the King James Version of the Bible, 1611 through 1769. Nobody here who carries a King James Bible, unless you've purchased a facsimile edition, has a 1611. When somebody says, I'm 1611 King James, I just say, let me see your Bible. No, really, you can go up here. It'll be this one, 1769. Um, we carry a 1769 because... All of the spelling was standardized. They used a dictionary. So instead of son being spelled S-O-N, S-O-N-N, S-O-N-N-E, S-O-N-E, all the different, different versions, because they just kind of threw it together like they wanted to throw it together, the spelling was standardized in 1769. Well, uh, the result of Erasmus's Greek New Testament, Erasmus laid the egg that Luther hatched. Reformation started right there in Germany and spread, but uh, Tyndall hatched the English aid, a, um, egg and um, uh, the Reformation spread better than in Germany. The translation of the Greek New Testament in the language of the people brought an end to the dark ages of Rome. Somebody says, well, huh, Rasmus was a Catholic. I beg to differ with you. A Catholic writer, Hugh Popes said, um, and the Pope is sanctioned by Rome, Erasmus was an heretic from Rome. 
Uh, he scoffed at images, relics, pilgrimages, and Good Friday observances. Why Good Friday observances? Because Christ was crucified not on Good Friday. You can't get three days and three nights by Good Friday. Well, anyway, he suggested Erasmus had serious doubts about every article of the Catholic faith, the math, confession, uh, and, uh, you know, the primacy of the Pope, uh, clerical celibacy, fasting, transubstantiation, abstinence. Erasmus also ridiculed the invocation of the saints um, uh, and uh, the reverence for relic and prayers to Mary. He rejected them all. Um, Erasmus's Greek New Testament was placed on Rome's forbidden book list by the Council of Trent. That meant that it was forbidden Catholics to ever read it without approval of their bishop upon pain of mortal sin. Was Erasmus a genuine Christian? Erasmus was relatively orthodox in his doctrine, including his belief in salvation. He wrote this treatise in preparation for his death. We are assured of victory over death, victory over the flesh, victory over the world, and Satan. Christ promised us remission of sin, fruit in this life a hundredfold, and therefore life eternal. And for what reason? For the sake of our merit? No, indeed! But through the grace of faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Christ is our justification. I believe, now listen to this, that there are many not absolved by the priest, not having taken the Eucharist, he's talking about the sacraments now, uh, not, um, uh, not having taken the Eucharist, not having been anointed, not having received Christian burial, who rest in peace, while many who have had all the rites of the church and have been buried next to the altar have gone to hell. Flee to his wounds, and you will be safe. Erasmus died in 1536, surrounded by his Protestant friends with no relationship whatsoever with the Roman Catholic Church. The Dark Ages shattered when the light of God's word shined in. Now, I don't want any of you skipping church, uh, but I will continue this series for our people uh, build on it next. We're going to look at the Bibles of the Martyr in Sunday School, and then we're going to look at the King James Bible in the morning service, and then we're going to look at things that are different or not the same in the evening service. So uh, we'll get you all through it by there. Uh, thank you so much for coming, uh, and let's have a word of prayer. And one of my deacons, Randy, is going to stand and close us in a word of prayer.